and me. My name is Wayne and I'm an addict. And I'm sure glad to be here with you tonight to begin our step seven. It's uh, an amazing journey working through these steps with you every year. And uh, you know, as we think about where we've been on step six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. And now here we are. We've humbly asked him to remove those defects, those shortcomings. And of course, steps six and seven overlap in emphasizing the significance of God's intervention in addressing our character defects. You can't address those yourself. You know, you've tried, I know you have. I've tried, and we've tried to no avail. We've tried to address those character defects. We've tried to, we've made resolutions on uh, uh, New Year's and said, I'm gonna change this and this and this about me, right? And then it's not very long afterwards and we're right back where we were. We can't do this by ourselves. This program of recovery, working the 12 steps in our lives, this spiritual journey that we are on, whatever you want to call it, this is a spiritual journey. It's not a journey of self-help. And the sooner we get that in our heads and in our hearts, the sooner we'll get better, right? The sooner we'll be able to get better because we realize that we're not doing this ourselves. That we have all the power of the universe behind us. And yet, here we are, time and time again, and we've all done it, trying to do it ourselves. We can't do it. Humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. There's the key right there, right? Humbly asked him. See, while step six focuses on our willingness to yield those flaws to God, and we talked about that willingness, that willingness for wisdom in our lives. We talked about that last Sunday, in fact. Step seven centers on the humility with which we need to approach our higher power. It's so important that we not confuse humility with humiliation. Some people think that putting myself down is humility. That's not humility. Humility isn't putting yourself down. It's not thinking poorly of yourself. It's just not thinking about yourself, right? It's not thinking about yourself. It's about keeping your eyes on your higher power, on your creator, on Jesus Christ. It's about keeping your attention, as Bill shared with me the other day, keeping my eyes on Jesus, the author, the finisher of the race, right? He's the one who's gonna take me through. My higher power is gonna give me the power to get on through. So God doesn't want us to put ourselves down, to think badly of ourselves, to develop that kind of negative approach to life or negative attitude. The truth is most of us have that already, right? Most of us already have a problem with negative thinking. Our negative attitude is probably the worst addiction that we have in our lives. Trying to be positive in your own power and your own ability doesn't work. Taking wonderful motivational courses, reading all the motivational books and positive thinking doesn't work. When Norman Vincent Peale wrote his classic book, The Power of Positive Thinking, years and years ago, he was going to call it the power of faith. And his editor said, who are you trying to reach, Norman? And he said, well, I'm trying to reach people who don't have faith. I'm trying to reach people who are struggling with negative attitudes. And he said, well, then you need to call it something else. And Norman said, well, why? He said, it's all about faith. And he said, yeah, it's all about faith, but, but people out there who are negative and people who are outside of the church and were outside of faith, they're not going to respond to a book like that. And of course, when he changed the name to the power of positive thinking, then the church turned on him all over. 
all over the world. They turned on him. And they said, what are you doing? You're a heretic. And it was, it was really heartbreaking when you think about it because this was the most humble man of God and who was used by God in such a powerful way, but he went ahead anyway. And the book, The Power of Positive Thinking, became one of the best sellers of the world, right? <laughs> Just a second. It's okay, it's okay Terry Lynn, we love you. I thought maybe that was God calling right there. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Brad, where was I? <laughs> the power of positive thinking, step seven, yeah. So, <laughs> so when he changed the title of the book to the power of positive thinking, so many people read that book that would not have read it if it was called The Power of Faith. And yet, when the people read it who were outside the church and outside the faith and who were negative thinkers, when they read it, they saw, oh my gosh, this is the most powerful thing that I've ever come across. I remember when I first read it in prison. I read that book and I knew I'd already experienced transforming faith in my life. But this built on that faith and helped me to know that it was possible for me with any... <laughs> honey, <laughs> did she go outside with it? Maybe go outside with it there. That's good. <laughs> I don't know how many more interruptions I can take tonight. <laughs> before I totally lose my train of thought. <laughs> Doesn't take much, does it? Anyway, okay, moving along, <laughs> moving along. Back to humility, that'll keep me on track. Back to humility. I need humility and this is how we get it. <laughs> we need humility for many different reasons, but I know for myself, there's three things that just jump out at me. First of all, so that I can recognize how big my character defects are, right? And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing for me to realize that my character defects are too big for me to handle by myself. I need help from God, right? I need help from God. One aspect of our addiction is that we tend to deny uh, or minimize, or end minimize rather, the pain that my defects inflict on me and on others. Therefore, as we, as we try to assess our character defects, we may, unless we take a very humble approach, underestimate their severity. Two, so that we can acknowledge the limits of human power in addressing these character defects. We cannot do it on our own. We cannot do it by sheer willpower, right? If, if we could do it by willpower, boy, all of us here would have had great success with that. How successful have you been with willpower? Has it been really, uh, isn't that interesting? Now I know people who would say, oh yeah, yeah, I mean, well good for you, good for you. Don't hang out with us. <laughs> hang out somewhere else where, where the people are still in denial. We'll, you know, go for it. We want to be out of denial. And we know we can't do it with sheer willpower because it's not about my will. It's not about my power. It's about his will and his power, right? That's it, that's it. We cannot do it by sheer willpower. We cannot do it by our own intellect and reasoning. And then the third thing that I, I feel really relates to me is that so that I can appreciate the enormity how great God's power is to transform broken lives, right? The power of God's love to transform broken lives. It's amazing. And I'm gonna share with you the scripture at this time. If, uh, if, there we go, there we go. From Hebrews chapter 12, verses one through 11. And how do we find humility? Well, here's how in Hebrews chapter 12. He tells us, and it's through discipline. 
It's through discipline. It's through allowing our higher power to lead us on a pathway of discipline. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And, and what I would say right here, in terms of step seven, the sin that trips us up is that sin of pride, right? And that lack of humility that says, I can do this myself. I can do this in my own strength and in my own ability. I can do this with willpower. If I just have more willpower, see? That's the sin that trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility that he endured from sinful people, even to the cross, right? The torture that he had, that he experienced, the death on the cross. Then you won't become weary and give up because you haven't endured that. After all, you've not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father. If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you were illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? Now for some of us, I know this is a, this is a real touchy scripture in reading. This is talking about a father who loves us unconditionally, right? God our father who disciplines us. What does that mean? What does it mean? It doesn't mean he beats us. It doesn't mean he beats us. It doesn't mean he's angry with us. He's mad at us. What automatically some of us, when we think of our fathers and we think of discipline, it's a negative thing. It was an angry thing. It was, it was a punishment that would beat you till you could hardly walk, right? So it's an awful thing to even comprehend for a moment. What this is talking about, discipline from God our Father who loves us, this is the discipline that lets us reap the results of our behavior. This is the discipline that doesn't say, Wayne, Wayne you can just go and do whatever you want. I love you so much, just go and do whatever you want and you won't ever have to pay the price, right? There were people who said to me when I was on trial for attempted murder years ago, people in the church and they meant well, they said, oh no, you're not going to have to go to prison now. You're not going to, and I said, what do you mean I'm not going to go to, I deserve to go to prison. In fact, I deserve to go to prison a whole lot longer than I went for. I was really looked at blessed, I'll tell you that. But the reality is, of course, I had done the crime, and so I needed to do the time, right? I wasn't expecting not to go to prison. I also wasn't expecting the amazing miracle that God did in sparing me a long sentence, right? But the reality was, if you do the crime, you do the time, right? And if you live that kind of life, whatever the life is that we're living, if we live the kind of life that says, you know what, I'm not humbling myself to God. I'm in control. I'm in charge. 
I'm going to run things, right? Well, then, you see, what God has to do is he has to discipline us. He has to allow us to fall flat on our face. Pride comes before a fall. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. Now, <laughs> just so we don't get, get a misunderstanding, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. I can't remember any that was. Can you? No. No, of course not. It's painful. But afterward, afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. I like the, the uh, New King James Version. It says, there will be the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And you see, that's what right living is. Right living is righteous living, right? It's right living. The peaceable fruit of righteousness. And so what happens is we follow through with what we talked about last Sunday night. We talked about introspection. We talked about seeking after a willingness for God's wisdom in our lives, for God's wisdom to direct our lives, right? Praying only for knowledge of his will and the power to carry it out. Introspection, constitutionally incapable, we, incapable we've discovered in how it works. We're constitutionally incapable of being honest with ourselves. We're incapable of grasping and developing um, a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Some people struggle with that their whole lives and never seem to be, to be able to break through. And it's partly, in part, because we're trying to do it ourselves. And we don't have that power. We don't have that, that ability. And so... Tonight, I, I don't want to get too long-winded here. I, could, I see I've got a lot more things here, but anyway. <laughs> I can see Pete. I, I don't want Pete to go to sleep up here in the front. So, <laughs> Not that he ever would, Pete, I know. It's too late. It's too late. <laughs> well, that was snoring. Was that snoring I heard up here? So just to close, the invitation to humility then is not an invitation to low self-esteem or a negative self-image. In fact, it's quite the reverse. Poor self-esteem may be camouflaged by a superficial sense of false pride and by a resistance to God's intervention. In contrast, if we have healthy self-esteem, we are freed to come out from behind our masks and to receive and appreciate God's greatness. When our self-esteem has been restored to a proper state of balance, we are able to comfortably humble ourselves before him. Right? That's the call to us tonight. To humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Let's share our step seven prayer, shall we? My creator... I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace.
the serenity of our loving God, which passes all human understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge of God's unconditional love for you, shown us in his Son, Jesus Christ, at Easter over 2,000 years ago, and still healing and transforming broken hearts and lives to this very moment. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and with yours, both now and forevermore. Amen. God loves you and so do I. Have a great week, folks.